Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another, in fact, our final uh, Cyber Policy Center uh, seminar of the uh, year. Uh, it's been a really fantastic uh, series of speakers, and today I'm really delighted to have another fantastic one to cap off our year. Um, before I get to that, um, just want to note that this is our four-year anniversary today for the Cyber Policy Center. Uh, really pleased with its growth and uh, really excited about that. Um, Today, I'm super thrilled to uh, introduce a fellow Canadian um, <laughs> who also is evidence-based and thinks really deeply. In fact, uh, you know, Angela Lee and I were talking earlier today. Of all the people that do research on um, adolescence and social media, you know, Candace ranks right up there as one of the, the top people that are looking at the evidence uh, and thinking from a developmental perspective about kids rather than a sort of social media first uh, approach, but really thinking deeply about the de developmental uh, aspects of, uh, of childhood and, and growth. And so I'd like to um, uh, introduce you to Candace Augers, who's professor at Irvine and, and uh, directs the ADAPT lab there. And as you'll see, she's had a huge influence on the field, including the report by the Surgeon General and, uh, and, and the APA, who draw heavily on, on her research. So really thrilled to have her. Please. Uh, join me in welcoming Candace. Thanks, Jeff. It's really rare that someone warms up the audience with a Canadian accent. <laughs> and so I feel like we can just flow, we can flow from there and get that out of the way. So um, thanks for the kind invitation. I'm here to talk to, with you for the next 30 minutes about kind of what I've learned along my journey in studying social media among kids. Um, I have to confess, I'm a developmental and quantitative psychologist who studied children's mental health for the last 20 years, so I am not an expert in digital technologies. I care about kids' mental health, so that's front and center, um, and I care that they, there's an evidence base that supports them and their mental health. So, um, Jeff mentioned the Social Surgeon General's report, so um, some of you might not be aware, but many will be, that this was released a couple of weeks ago. Um, a lot of media attention was directed to this report. Um, for those of you who haven't read it, I'll give you a brief recap of what it says. So there's some risks, there's some benefits. So it was pretty balanced on, on whole. Um, but they did note that more research is needed to fully understand the impact. But there's this, this word that they also used was profound risk of harm. That there's some evidence that there may be, right, this profound risk of harm, so they're gonna take a safety first approach, right? So that's fair, they, they wanna protect the nation's youth. They think there might be some evidence somewhere um, in the correlations that Jeff and I look at and um, there might be profound risk of harm. So we can, we can debate whether or not that's the right approach, but that's the approach that they took. Now, the report describes the risk and benefits but the media did not. So I, last night I Googled um, Surgeon General, right? Uh, social media, mental health. And this is what the media says about the report. So you'll see that the Surgeon General, it says it's, it's that's better? Okay. Um, profound risk of harm, right? Uh, to youth mental health. It's driving the youth mental health crisis. And what I have to say is my decade of kind of studying this issue, the biggest, and the most fascinating thing I found is this discrepancy between what the science says, or in this case, what some of the report says, and what the media and the popular perception is about an issue. So what am I going to say today? Um, I'm going to go through the evidence, or some of it, uh, around the associations between social media and adolescent mental health. I'm going to talk about these longitudinal designs, um, some of which we've done, that suggest we might actually be thinking about social media the wrong way that we might have it on the wrong side of this equation, that it might be our mental health, our current state, that's driving us to different use patterns versus social media as being the cause. I'm gonna talk a little bit about fears that we have, that many parents have, that my husband has about our children, and I have to talk him down repeatedly about this, um, about fears adolescents have and, and how that corresponds with the science. And then I'm gonna end talking about what we're seeing recently is that young people going online, most young people going online to seek out information, help for the mental health problems. And this is especially too true if they're suffering from depression and anxiety themselves. Okay. So associations between digital technologies. A lot of people have reviewed this research um, and we reviewed it in 2020. Uh, we did it, this in three ways. We looked at all of the, the meta-analyses and the syntheses that have been done. We looked at the longitudinal and daily data, and then we looked at the large-scale surveys that have been done on this topic, because they get a lot of attention, because they have a lot of kids in them. 
Um, and when we looked at that evidence, we concluded that really we can sometimes find effects. Most studies find no effect. Others find tiny small positive, tiny small negative ones. But there wasn't really this smoking gun that would have us believe um, the headlines that we're reading. So other people have done these meta-analysis. This is a list of some of the most recent ones. You might recognize an important name on the list here with Jeff's study, which is one of my favorite. It's one of the largest ones that have been, have been done. And there's a real set of common themes that come through all of these reviews of the literature. So this is what the scientists are saying about this topic. Again, it's a mix of small, negative, positive, mostly null findings. So Patty Valkenberg, um, she did a 2022 study. She analyzed 25 reviews that have been done on this topic. And again, they find a mix, small positive, small negative. When you look across these studies, one of the most interesting things is that virtually all of the studies are correlational, right? So there's no way to, to understand from the data the cause and the effect. <clears throat> and that's an issue. It's an over-reliance on self-reports. So young people are asked to self-report, often retrospectively, how much they use social media and their mental health, right? So we have this single informant. We know that in and of itself is going to lead to a correlation or maybe confounding. The longitudinal studies, and this was the great part about your meta-analysis, when you look at this, there's you know, kind of inconclusive evidence, but when you do see a signal, it seems that it might be early mental health problems predicting future social media use, but not vice versa. So, you know, this what, and the other thing is there's a huge amount of heterogeneity across these studies. Um, one of the studies that looked at just depression and social media use, they reviewed, all, among adolescents, reviewed all of those, and their, their big takeaway was there's so much variability across these studies. The other interesting point they made, and this is a second study from the bottom, was that if you're interested in adolescent mental health and you were putting together a list of risk factors, given the effect size, social media wouldn't be on it. And I think that's, that's kind of shocking. So there's two sets of questions, right? Does social media have any effects or impacts? And the other is, you know, if we're really interested in kids' mental health, is this something that should be in the conversation at all? Okay. So the large surveys in open science, here's an example of one of them. This is done by um, Andy Jabolski and Amy Orban. Um, they're, they're great scientists. The thing that is really fantastic about them is they put all of their data, all of their code online. So you can go in, you can reproduce the findings, you can tweak it. Now, what they wanted to know is, um, you know, researchers always make choices when they're analyzing these data. Some researchers might kind of fish through the data and report significant findings, even though you have a lot of different outcomes, a lot of different variables, ways you could combine this. So they did a specification curve analysis, and in their analyses, and this is just a plot of all of the analyses they did, and there actually turned out to be billions once you do all the combinations of 24 dependent variables plus a number of um, prediction variables of how social media is measured and all the control variables. And their conclusion is you have this standardized effect of about 0 0.005, so a really tiny, you know, negative, association that's documented. Again, this is a cross-sectional study, right? And it's possible that that variation is from lots of, lots of things, um, and we don't know what direction this goes. So this, this study caused a lot of um, controversy in the field, um, but in my view, it's really just a very interesting application that if you let the models and the data do its work, what does it actually come back with, and what is the, the magnitude of the effect size that we could be dealing with here? Um, we looked at the Monitoring the Future data. This data set is a large national study that's repeated every year of adolescents. And it was one of the um, first studies, I think, where people reported on a correlation between screen time at that point um, and kids' well-being. And this was the, the study or the findings that really started to sound the alarm that smartphones might have destroyed a generation. So we took another look at these data. They're publicly available. Um, one of my collaborators on this, Catherine Keyes, the lead author, she's actually one of the investigators, so we could go in and look at the longitudinal data also. And we wanted to ask this question, well, maybe it's the case that there's no effect in the whole population, but what about kids who are depressed, right? It seems logical, and I thought this initially when I came into this field, that there's gonna be certain subgroups of kids who are gonna be more vulnerable to social media or digital tech effects. So maybe we'll see stronger correlations among kids who are at risk for depression. We did not find this. Um, the only associations we found when we drilled through the data were the associations between depression and social media use for girls who had a low risk for depression. 
Right? So that wasn't, wasn't there. That was counter to our hypotheses. And then when we look at things over time, there's a lot of um, conversation now from older studies that are coming out. For the example, the, the rollout of Facebook in two, 20, um, 2004. So what does it mean over time, this association between digital tech use and well-being? And what we found is that early on, in 2009, you could detect some associations. By the time we get up to 2015, it's at zero, right? So as it becomes more normative, it seems to get closer to zero. This, as a methodologist, suggests that there's some selection going on in those early years about who's online a little bit more. And as the technology becomes more normative, we don't seem to see that effect. But just one interpretation. So after reanalyzing these data, we, you know, our conclusion was contrary to this popular narrative. Sorry if this sounds repetitive at this point, um, but this is the main kind of finding that keeps coming up. Um, social media use wasn't a strong or consistent risk factor for depressive symptoms in the way that we thought it would be. So the longitudinal research, now this is really interesting. We do longitudinal studies. We follow kids from birth into adulthood. Um, more recently, I've been doing embedded birth designs where we follow a cohort of young adolescents repeatedly and intensively over time. And so this gives us a little bit more information than those correlational studies. Um, and when you look across these data, again, what you see is maybe we're thinking about this arrow, maybe it has to be flipped. So this is the study I referenced before. Um, it was a Canadian study, so there's a little bit of bias here in our reporting, um, but a relatively large study of kids that have been followed up annually. And what they found in that study, and they had a sample of young adolescents and a sample of college students, is that if you looked at the relationship between social media and depression, they only found it among girls. Um, and it was stronger among younger girls. Okay, so that makes sense. But if you went in and drilled a little bit further, what you see is what you'd expect. If you're depressed at time one, you're more likely to be depressed at time two, so that's just continuity of depression. Same thing as social media use, your frequency at time one predicts your frequency at time two. But look at these cross-legged associations, again, only present for girls. We don't find social media use predicting later depression. What you find is earlier depression predicting frequency of social media use, right? And this makes sense, as someone who studied depression, for a long time, I can tell you that when you're depressed, you select into different environments, you select different behaviors, right? We see associations between depressive symptoms and time spent in bed, but to my knowledge, the Surgeon General has not issued an advisory yet about beds, right? And kids' mental health. So um, I promised I would be good. Okay, that was not good. Okay, so um, the, the thing that we, we try and do in our lab too is try and get at this um, nomothetic versus ideographic difference. So, you know, on the average, this whole conversation in the media and in many of the big studies has been about what's happening at the population level. And the hypotheses are that, well, maybe the population level doesn't matter as much. Maybe there's subgroups of kids that might be more vulnerable. So that, to estimate that, we either need to do subgroup analyses or we need to follow intensively kids over time and understand what their specific risk um, or benefits might be in these, these situations. So this is a study that um, we did in North Carolina. We were lucky to have access to the school records of every child who attends public school in the state of North Carolina. And this was a great thing because then we could understand the sample that we eventually selected, how well does it generalize back to those children. North Carolina is also pretty representative of the population of the United States in terms of income, um, race, ethnicity, et cetera. So we had 2,000 kids that we, we sampled in 2015. That is a map of the state of North Carolina. Um, each of those dots is where someone in our study lived. And there's 100 counties in North Carolina, so we also had geocoded and got some contextual information on the neighborhoods um, and the counties that the children lived in. Um, we did some embedded um, burst design here for 400 of these kids, a representative subsample. We went into their homes, we did some cognitive tests, we did biological data collection, we gave them wearable devices to track their sleep, et cetera, and then we followed them for 14 days, um, three surveys each day to try and understand their experiences in the world and online, their symptoms, their sleep, their cognitions, um, and, then, and then looked at those data. And one of the questions we asked was whether or not there were any daily linkages between social media use or digital technology use and, and kids' well-being across a number of measures. So this was across 13,000 observations, about 5,000 days. 
Um, we found no daily linkages between digital tech use and daily mental health. So the difference between this study and others is a lot of the other studies are taking a comparison between a kid who spends an hour a day online and a kid who spends five hours a day online, the between kid comparison. Now those kids might look different on their social media or digital tech exposure, but they also look different on a whole host of other things, right? Their family SES, how their day is structured, what their genetic risk for depression might be. So our approach takes a within person design. So we're actually asking the question of what's your depression look like on days that you use more or less social media or digital technologies compared to yourself, right? So each kid is used as their own control. So that's a more, um, kind of stringent and, and harder test for social media usage. But again, these are longitudinal correlational data. We're not randomizing the social media or the digital tech exposure here, but even so, we find no daily linkages be between the two. The only links we find are in the opposite direction, um, which is that young adolescents who are more connected via text or, or uh, messaging reported better well-being, and we found similar um, daily findings and similar findings when we aggregate in another sample in California as well. So again, not huge effects or correlations, but opposite to what people would expect if you believe that social media was, was leading to negative outcomes. We also explore this idea that there might be subgroups of kids who are at heightened risk, right? So I'm again, I'm, I'm explaining the average. These are the average effects, even though we estimate it at an individual <coughs> level, I'm, I'm telling you about the average here. So let's go in and see if we can see if there's any moderation, if there's any groups that might be at elevated risk. We did 96 tests using moderators um, and nothing that survived correction for multiple testing. So we don't actually have um, evidence that there, from this study, right, from one study, that there's this differential kind of effects that we're seeing. And this runs counter to something that I publicly kind of hypothesized and said, so I'm checking my own assumptions here against, against data. That's not to say that they're not there in the world, that's just we don't find them when we look in this way. And these are my two um, former trainees that worked on this, um, Mikey Jensen, who's now at UNCG, and then Madeline George, who's at RTI. So more recently, people have criticized having kids report on their social media use. So we relied on kids' reports in that study. They reported at the end of the day. So we thought, well, that's a better metric than asking kids to report over the last 30 days, you know, give us your average time. So at the end of each day, they reported on their social media use, their time engaging in digital technology, their communication online. Um, more recently, with 130 of these young people, we've been doing passive sensing, and so we've been using the EARS tool, and so this gets installed on the kids' phones, they, you know, with their consent and their coordination, and they um, go out into the world, and they um, are tracked in terms of their geolocation. We install a new keyboard onto the phone, so every word that gets put into the phone, regardless of what app it is, gets recovered, and we run that through kind of large language models to understand something about the affective nature of what they're saying online. Um, we estimate sleep on this, um, et cetera, and we have Android and we have um, um, iOS users. This graph just shows you across the 90 days of the study what kind of coverage we get on this, and as you can see, the, um, the biggest thing that separates these is whether you're an iOS or an Android user. So on Android phones, we can collect a lot more data on our participants, right? But the Android participants look a little different on some other dimensions. Um, but across the 90 days, um, we don't see, we see some decline in kind of the amount of data we can collect on each of these dimensions, but passively we seem to be able to collect a, quite a bit. Um, this next slide is just a correlation matrix and it tells you we had an EMA at the, um, and in the morning to get, you know, kind of ground truth on how kids might have slept or felt they slept, their negative affect, positive affect, and the first three columns are when we look at this in a daily level between the passive measures we derive from the phone, so this is without any input from the kids, each one of these um, rows, and then the column is what we get when we get re reports. And you can see that we get some signal to noise in terms of our passive sensing. We can um, see, for example, that app use is related to um, positive and negative affect. The other three um, lines, or three columns on the end of that are what happens when you aggregate across the 90 days, so we get a stronger signal in the daily measures. Um, and so this has some methodological implications. But this is, you know, I think where the future is going is in terms of passive sensing and figuring out how we can creatively 
integrate some of these different types of, of ways of measuring and capturing kids' online use. Now, we're still relying a lot on time. Uh, we need to get more into the content field of what they're actually doing, um, but this is one step. Okay. So um, the third message I had is that fears of social media, um, that social media is addictive, are very high. Um, and this is true among parents, this is true among policymakers, this is true among tech executives apparently uh, these days, and among adolescents themselves. And so we actually asked kids, so in our study of 2,000 kids in North Carolina, um, we asked them whether or not social media, time online was impairing their day-to-day -day functioning, and virtually all of the kids endorsed at least one of these items. So 90% of the kids said social media, digital technology, time online was impairing some aspect of their daily life. Okay. Then what we did is we took data on them from their school records, from symptom reports, from the EMA data, from parent reports, um, from well-validated clinical measures, and we triangulated this to, to test whether or not we had any evidence of impairment based on their amount of exposure. And we did not find that that was the case. And so we find few reliable you know, linkages between social media use and standardized test scores, child or parent reported symptoms. So there's a gap here. Right? Lots of reasons that could be, but again, the, one of the most interesting findings has been this, this discrepancy between what we can find and see in the data and what people believe. Um, and this is where you know, Jeff's research comes in again, this addictive versus neutral framing, the choices that researchers make also when we ask people about their social media use, if we ask people to just subjectively report what they do versus we frame it in a more addictive or problematic way. Um, framing, then that's going, that impacts whether or not we actually find an association in the study. Right? So this type of thing matters. Um, so early on, this is where I said that I was wrong. I was wrong, and I was wrong in nature. So like that's the worst place to be wrong. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, wrong in the sense that I said, you know, there's probably not an aggregate effect, but we're going to find these subpopulations where there, there's, you know, potential for harm or potential for negative effects. And then I showed you in our own study we went through and we couldn't, we couldn't find it. Um, we find some evidence of, like, self-reported spillovers. So we find kids that are in low-income households, um, they're more likely to report that social media causes problems in their offline life. And so here, it causes, they believe it causes more face-to-face -face arguments, more trouble at school, those types of things. Um, the, other, the other point I made here is that I thought that we were potentially missing the point of focusing on the impacts of social media on depression, anxiety, um, when we're not seeing the effects there. But what we really need to be paying attention to is the different ways that young people have opportunities online, the different types of experiences they have. And this is especially true when you go across social, socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. right? So we find children in low-income households. In our study, they spend anywhere from about one and a half to three more hours per day online. That time is more likely to be unsupervised. It's more likely to, to have the absence of a caregiver who's kind of mediating those experiences, which we know from other you know, research really can make a difference. So the point here was um, you know, not that social media and smartphones are causing mental health um, problems, but that we, if we're focusing on that, we might be missing these other problems, which is young people who are less supported in their offline lives are uh, potentially having different experiences in their online lives and different access to the opportunities and potentially different um, exposures to the risks. Okay, so the last point that I wanna make before we uh, open up this for discussion is that recently, um, you know, and this, this was happening before COVID and the, the trans, transfer to digital health, but adolescents are online, right? We've been struggling for years in developmental and clinical psychology to get adolescents to come into our clinics and to go through our evidence-based CBT modules or whatever we have shown to work. And again and again and again, we find there are barriers to accessing treatment, that the number of kids who are struggling just simply don't get help. But young people are online, right? So the obvious thing, maybe, is to go meet them where they're living and deliver these types of interventions and supports. So we know, actually, that they are, from surveys, that they are likely to go online to seek out information about their mental health, to be willing to use a mental health app. But then when you ask and you find, look into whether or not they're actually doing that or receiving services online, it's not happening. And part of that, um, we've done a review. This is work with Stephen Schuler 
who has this great resource. For any of you who have a team or are interested in digital mental health apps, it's called CyberGuide. Um, and what he does, it's like a consumer reports of online apps. And so he goes through the apps that are available on the open marketplace and he gives them a grade across all kinds of dimensions, right? Whether they are evidence-based, how often they're accessed and downloaded, how often they're opened if they're accessed and downloaded, how they treat the, your data in terms of privacy. So it's a, it's a great resource. They've recently released a guide for teens. So they go through the, um, the apps that are specifically targeted for young people. And this was important because when we reviewed this research, the question was, well, why aren't young people getting these services online? And the truth was that there were very few platforms or apps that were actually tailored for adolescent populations, right? A lot of it was meditation for kind of old uh, middle-aged adults. Okay, so 80% of young people have gone online to seek out information um, for mental health, and that's especially true if they're depressed or experiencing depression. And many report social media as providing a social support. Um, we have some evidence for these digital mental health interventions that they can be effective, but again, adolescents are left out of the design and the delivery of these solutions. So this seems like a really important area for future investment. You know, I'm not up here advocating that this is going to be a solution, but this certainly seems like it could be part of it. Okay. And so to close this research, the practice gap. Okay, so where do we go from here? I'm gonna try and anticipate some of your uh, questions. So on the research front, I think that, you know, it's clear from the studies that we reviewed, I'm sure from the studies that Jeff has reviewed, that we need to go towards designs that can actually support causal inference. Everyone, the big question, and it's gonna be the big question in the lawsuits that are coming, it's the big question in the minds of parents, is does social media cause, right, mental health problems? You know, is, does it cause them initially? Does it cause them to get worse? And we just can't design it. We, or we can't answer that with the data that we have from these large correlational studies, right? We just have a correlational mess. The moving behind screen time, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Right now, all screen time is equal, and we've known that for a long time, yet we've been kind of methodologically stuck, other than a few innovators that are, that are pushing the field. Um, so this less reliance on self-report data, and then this movement from a one-size-fits-all approach. So we're hearing a lot about generative AI, right, personalization algorithms. This is like the perfect problem, right? I'm a parent. I don't care, so not me, I'm saying a parent, what the you know, average effect size is for the population. Most parents want to know, is time on this device or app you know, bad for my kids' sleep or attention, right? We could actually compute those estimates, right, uh, from an ideographic approach. We've been doing that in the research lab. You know, I think we could do that um, in the industry space also. But really moving away from this one-size-fits-all conversation. We saw a bit of that in the Surgeon General's report, right? So it called out that there are these opportunities for people who've been minoritized, marginalized, to find safe spaces and communities online. So I think we're, we're getting there. Um, but the, the conversation quickly reverts back to kind of a single singular narrative. Okay, so the more radical departure, maybe it's not radical anymore. Um, I'm kind of just, I'm done <laughs> with, the, with the sorting through the, bat, the correlational data. Um, and I think the reason um, I had this realization when we actually three different research teams looked at the exact same correlation derived from the exact same data set, like the exact same number, and then went out and told the world very different stories about that, right? Um, because, we, because there wasn't a story that could be there wasn't a test of causal impacts that could be made from that, right? And so I think it's, it's gonna be a waste of time to keep doing this correlational um, kind of hamster wheel thing. We need this within platform A-B testing, right? And that's gonna require some partnerships with industry that raises all kinds of conflict of interest issues, all kinds of challenges for how we do that, how we do that safely with kids, how we do that in partnership with parents and families. Um, and then we need to start kind of backing up a little bit and asking the question of, well, what do we actually want these spaces to look like? Not just how can we shut them down, right? How can we get the phone out of our kids' hands? Um, but the kids are there, right? Uh, if we know anything from like decades of parenting research and being a parent yourself, right? If you're telling them it's bad for them, they are gonna probably do it eventually. Um, so you know, what, what's, what's our strategy here? And I think the strategy, one of the most effective strategies could be moving into this space in a way that is designing digital mental health solutions, designing with kids to try and figure out how those spaces 
ought to look if we're designing or optimizing for something other than time or eyes on screen and we're designing to support the key um, pieces of development we know, know need to click for a healthy brain and body. So I'm going to stop there. I think it's oh, 30 minutes um, as promised and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, great, wonderful. Thank you, Candace, so much for that uh, careful overview of, of a gigantic literature. Um, and I'm feeling very similar to you about uh, rehashing correlations uh, at this point. Um, we'll open up uh, questions both here in the uh, audience and online. And uh, Sunny will run the microphone around. And while we're waiting for our first question, my main one, we talked a little bit about this, uh, is about the notion of effects. And I think the big question is going to be, what is an effect? What do, we, what do we in psychology mean by an effect size? And what could um, you know, sort of parents or policymakers take away from this idea that we're saying that there's either little effects, mixed effects, or small effects? Because I think there's a, like for policymakers, it's either does it matter or not? And that sort of notion of effect size is a little unusual. So um, I had the good fortune of living with economists for years, and so this, this, this response is going to sound very much uh, similar to their, their take on this. I think we should not be using the word effects, right? So the entire literature that we're talking about is correlations, and so the argument that's happened has been about, well, it's a small effect, a small correlation, but the outcome is really serious. In this case, it's depression or suicide. The prevalence of the exposure is really high. In this case, social media use. So we need to take a safety first approach and just shut everything down if we have evidence of a small effect. But that initial stance, as you know, was, um, you know, and Rosenthal detailed this beautifully, was an aspirin trial where it had been randomly assigned. The outcome was heart attack, right? Was death. Um, and the randomization of the aspirin allowed us to say we need to stop the trial, a small effect can have meaningful impact. So right. I would say we're in the wrong space of talking about effects for yeah. the most part. Yeah, yeah. I think in our meta-analysis it was 70, over 70 percent were just correlation. So I agree that's going to be a key issue. Yeah. Ryan. Hi. Th thanks so much for your, your talk. Um, on the kind of reverse causality notion where like depression may you know, cause social media use, um, is there anything you could say from your data or the literature on, is that effective? Does that help ameliorate um, the depression that drives people to use social media more? Does that depend? Um, if you could just say more about that, I'm really interested in that. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. So the, um, the survey I showed about the number of kids who report going online to seek help, that same sur survey asked young people to report on whether or not they felt better when they, after they spent time on social media. So that's, and these were kids who were experiencing depression. So again, the evidence we have here is perceptions of how it makes them feel. So, so I think what we really need to do is back up and start designing those studies, which are really about how do these offline characteristics, whether that's mental health, whether that's family composition, whether that's access to you know, these types of resources, how does that predict how we engage with the online world versus just setting up the equation from the beginning in the one arrow? So I, I, don't, I don't know that we have a lot of great studies that are, um, have looked at that, the arrow going the other way. Thanks, Candice. Over here. <coughs> Thank you for your talk. I am very conflicted, so I'm going to try to be as <laughs> calm as I can. I was probably thinking about the time when uh, people were blaming Marlboro for, uh, for, you know, for being sick, or people mm -hmm. suing gun manufacturers because of. Uh, so I want to probably frame my question in that space. I run a helpline uh, for people who are the receivers of online abuse. So in maybe the cause of social media is one thing, but probably the person behind the effect is what happens in there. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to just take this, thank you. 
Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And thank you for the work you do on helplines. So getting kids connected in a just-in-time way is one of the ways that we should be leveraging new technologies to support their mental health. That is absolutely critical, so thank you. Um, and, I, y you know, you're right. Most of the studies and the ones that Jeff has reviewed, they've really been focused on time versus content, right? And that's the qualifier that we always give, too. So it's possible that when we go in and we start measuring content exposure, when we develop the tools to do that, we'll see a medium or a large effect. What I'm saying is that we haven't seen it yet. I'm not saying it's not there. Um, and that the response, and historically, you know, what we've seen with responses to new technologies has been a panic over what they might be doing to our kids, right? And I think the next question is, well, what's the harm in stopping this if there's a potential? Is that fair? So what's the, what's the harm in kind of slap, stopping this social media exposure, online exposure, if even there's a, a chance that it's hurting our kids. Um, and the, the reaction that I often have is, is that we actually take the conversation in a very different way. So I've been studying mental health for a long time, and when I first heard you know, this idea that social media might be the cause of the uptick, I was excited about that because we could shut it off, we could help our kids, um, it would be a solution, it's malleable, but, you know, it's, it's not going to be that, that simple. Great. Candice, there's questions online, um, a, a lot of great ones. One of them is sort of around um, something I get a, as well, which is could we be at the early times sort of like in the way that um, the smoking era where uh, it, early on it looked like maybe there was conflicting data and maybe there wasn't an effect and over time it becomes clear. Is there, do you worry about that potential? That's one of the questions coming from online. Yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to check my assumptions against data, right? And so, um, you know, we've put out, and that's, that's kind of what this process has been done. Like every new data that com comes out, I want those randomized studies. I mean, that's how we got there right. with cigarettes. You know, we can't go to an animal model, right? right? And right. understand what happens if we expose nicotine, you know, the mouse to nicotine. Um, so we can't get a mechanism that way that way, but we need to up the level of evidence. If we're gonna talk about depression, if we're gonna talk about suicide, if we're gonna talk about things that kill our kids, we need to have a level of evidence that is comparable to what we expect in the medical field. And we, right. we don't have that. We haven't yeah. taken it seriously. Yeah, right? yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, Chen Yen and then we'll get you. Thank you so much for the great talk. It's very thought provoking. So about the within platform A-B testing, I'm curious about what kind of intervention you are envisioning, either like upranking the content or resources that supports mental health or trying to better identify or locate people, either teens or adolescents with mental health issues. Just curious about your thoughts on the interventions. Yeah, so with that comment, it was um, it was a bit of a push to move to the solution space. And the A-B testing, I would in no way um, recommend that we go expose negative content, but instead think about a positive intervention. So can we push out a, messa you know, a message or a nudge that would be to um, seek social support if we believe that, um, you know, being outside is part of this, you know, giving up the phone, getting kids off the phone is part of it, pushing kids to do kind of other things. So I think there's a ton of... Um, kind of ways that we could do micro interventions in the positive space. Maybe it's reframing, you know, a view towards how you use social media. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which both are. Angela Lee's work on yeah. mindsets, for example, yes. Um, one other thing, and uh, this is just maybe a chance for you to clarify, but one of the questions is like, so are you saying the U.S. Surgeon General's advisory is wrong, which I don't think you are. So could you clarify sort of your take, because they're asking like, if it's not based on cause and effect, then what is, where is this warning coming from? Yeah, so I think what, what the Sur Surgeon General did in their report is they walked a fine line where they said, we don't know. So they admitted, we don't know. Um, the evidence isn't in, but they felt, and their office felt, and we had a number of conversations, that there was enough evidence that they wanted to take a safety-first approach. And that's fair. And they came out and did a, you know, and with the report, they balanced some of the positive, potential positive effects, potential negative effects, made it clear that they were taking a safety-first approach. Now, what we saw in that, second slide I showed was the reaction, right, to the media, was some of it the promotion of the report itself from the Surgeon General's office that fit this narrative of cause, um, that social media is the cause of our kids' mental health crisis. 
um, that it has to be shut off. And, and so the, I think that, um, that narrative, I would argue, is actually harmful to kids and families. So we, the number one, or one of the number, number one causes of conflict in families is time spent on devices. We know conflict in families actually isn't great for kids' mental health, right? Uh, so there, there's that part of it. A messaging that this is a, a bad behavior, something you shouldn't be doing, that's addictive, that's shameful, can lead to guilt among kids for having a lack of self-control, for going online to do really normative things, you know, spend time with their friends, watch a cat video, right? And I'm not saying that all interactions are that benign. I understand the risks that exist, and we released a report in December that talked about the risks and the benefits. Um, the point is that there, there are costs to, to selling the story if they might not be true. Yeah, completely agree with that. I, you know, the amount of time I have to talk down parents um, who are just really, really worried, and and they're operating in an information space where there's a lot of fear, and and a lot less sort of like here are tangible solutions beyond telling your kid to not use it. Uh, I agree, and then that that attitude gets um, pushed down to the to the children. Um, another thing that's come out a lot in the press is the difference between boys and girls and adolescents. And there's a few uh, questions here online. Could you speak a little bit to, especially coming from your background as a developmental and mental health person first approach, to to you know what what is going on and any difference between boys and girls in the relationship to social media? Yeah, so it's interesting when we do see associations, they're there for girls, they're there for young girls, they're there in this 10 to 13 year old range. This is also the prime age, and it al has always been for onset of puberty, onset of depression and anxiety symptoms in a real way, right? So that's, that's happening. But when the associations, associations are there, there's been a real um, interesting narrative that's emerged here around young girls being at risk. And it's been about, in many ways, with eating disorders, it's been about a, a body image or um, seeking out kind of a, a perfect image in, in social media. But this is another case, if you actually look at what they're viewing online, then the representation in terms of body types, in terms of match with their ethnicity, in terms of their identity status, is so much more diverse than it was, say, when you and I were growing up, where a group of Hollywood execs decided there was one archetype of female beauty, and they shoved that everywhere, mm -hmm. right? And so it's interesting when you do focus groups where you look through what kids are actually following. They're following influencers who match their religious beliefs, their cultural identity, their um, you know all kinds of interests, and they're selecting into this these followings. Now again, not to say that there's not kids that might be at risk for these kinds of exposures. Those kids who are already suffering from eating disorders, those kids who might be at risk for um, rejection sensitivity. Right? Those are those are things we need to pay attention to, but the narrative around this has gotten so singular that we need to protect our young girls. They have no agency, right? They're vulnerable to this female, you know, kind of body yeah. image yeah. Yeah. problem. Great. Thanks, Candice. Um, we'll have a question over here. Or is there somebody with the mic? Oh, who has the microphone now? Oh. Hold on one second so that people online can hear you. Thank you. Um, so as a layperson, I think I see this narrative in the media that there's a teen mental health crisis and it's caused by social media. Um, and uh, you're saying the narrative, that narrative's not really supported by the evidence at this point. Are there alternative narratives that are better supported by the evidence? For that? That's a great question. So um, in 2020, I wrote a report for Common Sense Media that addressed this issue. And one of the graphs, and I'll, I'll share it with you, is essentially, if you're a 19-year-old kid today, and if you're a 12-year-old kid today, what, what have you experienced? So the 19-year-old kid was born in the aftermath of Columbine. They've lived through the Great Recession. They've lived through a number of um, movements that have really changed the way that they view themselves in the world, right, in terms of Black Lives Matters, in terms of the Me Too movement, right? There have been a number of things that have happened, you know, big societal shifts um, that, uh, that have happened. The, the biggest thing, the 2008 Great Recession, you know, if you look at that in terms of community job loss and shocks in the same data that's blaming social media for this, you see that it, it absorbs as much, if not more, of the effect on the increases in, in youth suicide. We've seen increases in suicide across every single age group, right? We are narrowing in and uh, on 
young people because there's been a bit more of an uptick among young girls off a low base rate, but every single demographic group in America, except the very old, have had an increase, right? We've had an opioid epidemic. The other thing that's happening is that the composition of American youth is changing, right? It is changing um, in really amazing ways. So, you know, 25% of kids are first or second generation immigrants, including my own. You know, 30% of them identify with a minoritized identity. We know discrimination plays a role in this, right? So there's a total changing demographic. One in every two kids, so 50% of teens, live in low income or poverty, right? Guess, you know, guess how that relates to mental health. So there's a whole host of things that are big risk factors that are playing into this, um, you know, that we, we need to consider alongside this, this narrative about social media. So those are a few. I'm happy to send you a copy of the, the paper where we walk through this. Thanks, Candice. It's always important because I think people are, are, are seeing this mental health crisis and, and want to know, like, what's causing it. And <clears throat> I think the phone is a very salient, easy thing to point to, and it may be playing a role. But as you say, all these other structural things that are kind of invisible um, are, are likely to play as big, uh, as big a role. Uh, another theme of questions coming in is uh, around AI. Uh, we've been talking a fair bit about that here. Um, could you, you know, think about or speculate how you might see AI playing a role uh, on kids' mental health? And, and I know we don't have any studies into that, so everybody's asking you for just any thoughts you have to peer around the corner. So if anyone from NSF is watching, we just put in a rapid response <laughs> to survey a gr group of kids uh, on this. Uh, so it's going to be interesting, right? So I think the things we don't know is how kids are interacting with AI. All the attention has been our kids using ChatGPT to cheat on tests. But are kids using ChatGPT to get you know, it, um, you know, advice on relationships? Are they using it when they're lonely? What kinds of things are they asking? You know, and, and trying to get some guidance on. So that's gonna be a whole interesting you know, field. There's also, it's also possible that two years from now, none of us will be talking about social media. The next warning that comes out will be, is generative AI harming our children, right? And we've seen this with waves of moral panic around new technologies. I don't know enough to have a stance on, on whether I'm gonna panic or not, but that seems to be the cycle that we're, we're in, is the new technology comes out, mm -hmm. we look at the kids, right. we don't really like as adults what what they do in general <laughs> with their right. time, yep. um, and then we, we go from there. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's probably right, that that's what we'll start seeing soon too. Um, one other question that I wanted to get at is sort of articulating um, what the actual harms could be. So um, you had mentioned a stu uh, that study that was like, if you were to say social media was a, an issue, what would you place it up against, right? Um, at the National Academy of Sciences, that's one thing we work on. It's like, what would the actual harms be rather than just saying in general? So as you've looked through the literature, what are some of the things that would be actual harms that you'd be concerned about? And then what are solutions that you would see that might be related to this? So the biggest thing when I started to kind of go into this area that I was worried about was an amplification of existing inequalities because kids who were in already well-resourced families and schools we're getting new technologies tailored in ways that helped them in, in big ways with learning, potentially with mental health. Yeah. And so it was another way in which we had this kind of segregation in, you know, of offline spaces coming into online spaces. And so the idea is if you leave kind of the new technologies or the innovation unchecked, the rich will get richer, mm -hmm. right? And we've been struggling, and especially during COVID, to close some of these gaps. Mm -hmm. So the promise of it always is that we can use it you know, to kind of offset, to close, to identify mm -hmm. these gaps, but time and time again, we see this spread. Yeah. And so, the, you know, the question is, how are young kids who are maybe not supported um, as much in their homes and in their communities with understanding how to use new technologies in ways that promote risk or promote opportunity and reduce risk? Mm -hmm. You know, are a certain group of kids getting kind of less skills or less support mm -hmm. in, in making that happen. Right. And so would you see education or any, any particular kind of education as playing a role here? I think so. You know, so there, this is tough because we know, we know what happens when we go in and talk to kids about what to do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a, there's a world in which, you know, youth, psychologists, regulators work together in, or in order to, um, 
you know, create an online experience or online exposures that help to reduce those gaps. And I think they have to be in real time. I think they have to be calibrated with the young person. Yeah. I'm not sure that a kind of a, a curriculum is going to, it's going to be a part of the solution, but I yeah. don't know that it's going to be what helps us to close a right. growing gap. Yeah, especially if you're thinking about older teenagers or mid mid teenagers that get the eye roll. Right. But, yeah. You often uh, talk about sort of youth involvement. Um, here we had a um, at the D school a, a sort of youth centered uh, design solution where they're creating. A, what what some thoughts you have about how youth can play a role in the solution? Um, currently, they're kind of being left out of much of the policy making that's taking place. Yeah, so I think there's, um, you know, there's a traditional ways that everyone's trying to do this, which is like a youth advisory board or kind of getting youth impact, having youth representation, but those are often very kind of special youth too, right? They're often not the ones that we're trying to kind of reach and help close this gap. Um, I think that we need to think creatively and in some ways around these new tools that allow us to reach more young people, not in Stanford or the yeah, UC right. system, but out in their homes and their communities right. to let us know kind of what they need, when they need it, um, and how it might work work for them. So we're really good at, the industry is really good at this and kind of the gaming field and kind of understanding when we want to sell kids something, we can figure this out, right? But when we want to help kids, we just can't seem to mobilize the resources. So I, I think there's a solution there. We just need to mobilize the resources to, to get engagement on that broad level. Yeah, no, I completely agree. All right, are there other questions here in the, in the room? Yeah. Otherwise, I'll just keep asking all the questions. Oh. <clears throat> I apologize if this sounds too naive, but I wanted, I wanted to know whether you could comment on uh, the difficulty of getting the, uh, I guess, the population for the control and test groups in determining causation of the negative effect. The only group I can think of where there's a substantial number of people who don't use this technology could serve as the control group would be the Amish. And at the same time, there's also a lot of people from the Amish group who have left that community and now use the technology. So they will be your test group. Yeah. That's, that's the only group I can think of that satisfies easily uh, an experiment to determine causation. Yeah, so I think there's different kinds of experiments. Some could be within individual and exposure of different types of content, right? So we don't need to have like a completely naive group. The other way people are doing this is kind of delayed onset. So the real question for parents is like, what age do I allow my kids to be on social media? What age do I allow my kids to have a phone? So there are, you know, randomized controlled trials trying to get kids to delay or get families to delay um, exposure to social media or, or having their own phone and follow those kids through and kind of test that. Now there's, you know, you have to be careful about how you do that. And in the most recent iteration, um, of that work with um, Hunt Elcock, I've, I've kind of made the case that we should measure the negative things, uh, you know, whether it leads to, m to kind of increased depression if they get it earlier, but we should also start to measure what it might be cutting off for kids, right? Is it cutting off access to information on reproductive health for kids who might be in communities where that's not being offered in schools, right? So I think as we go forward with these experiments, whether it's delayed, um, you know, kind of exposure to social media or the phone or whether it's exposure to different types of content, we need to think about the outcomes we're looking at in a really broad way to test our assumptions versus going in and assuming that it's going to be a positive or a negative effect. Great, great. Uh, I have a kind of a related question, which is, so as, as a psychologist, wh one of the things I've been worrying about, and I'm curious if you do too, is that we are focused sort of at the individual level, them interacting through their, through their device, but also maybe with a small subset of, of friends, are there sort of externalities that psychologists don't think about that would come more at like sociological or economic levels that maybe we look at this psychological level and, and don't see anything, but there's some sort of say network effect or something like that that we're, we're just missing because of our lens. Do you, does that keep you up at night at all? Yeah, so I started life as a sociologist. Oh, yeah. is that right? <laughs> I didn't know that. So I think that's right. I mean, I th and I think, um, you know, we, we do focus in on the individual level, and that has been the question, you know, on, on people's minds around mental health. But collectively, you know, what does that mean for societal norms and values? Right. I mean, this has been the biggest question in the political sphere. What does it mean for us trying to live together with different beliefs that may or may not get more? solidified so you know in a perfect world we'd, we'd be trying to calibrate and understand these kind of aggregate or network type effects and the individual 
one. Yeah. 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 yeah it's hard, right? This is going to be one yeah. of the big, the big questions. Okay, great. Um, all right, we're coming to the end of our session. Any other last questions? Fantastic. Well, Candice, this has been so eye-opening. I, I think like everybody here, but also certainly the themes in, in the um, comments online is a little bit just like, really? <laughs> um, one of the things that I'll, I'll ask, and to a degree you feel comfortable, so a, a couple of people have been asking just about like how your research is funded and with concern that maybe you're um, yep. getting funded by the platforms, et cetera. So could you just uh, you know give a little description of how your work is funded? Yeah, so my initial work in this area was funded by the WT Grant Foundation. Um, the Ray study that I um, s reported on there was funded by NIDA, so the National Institute for Drug Abuse. Um, most recently, I um, started a network which is funded by the Jacobs Foundation that's interested in child learning. Um, now, as part of that network, we do have industry, we're trying to form industry collaborations. And so this has been a purposeful choice. You know, I've not been funded by tech to do my research in the past, but I think we need to bring them into the kind of tent to understand what's happening on these platforms and we need to work with them for solutions because that's where the kids are. So within that new series network that started in 2021, we do have industry partners where we partner with them to access their data. We have students that are embedded for internships. There's a lot of computer scientists that work with us where internships are pretty normal um, for that. But yeah, that's. That's the funding. It's not okay. as interesting as one might, <laughs> <laughs> one might no, like. I, I appreciate that, Cass. Yeah, and I think it's good for people to know. And this is going to be complicated because as we start to work with the platforms, which we have to do, um, being able to talk about conflict of interest in a sort of a straightforward way where it's not just yeah. dismissed one, one side of it is going to be really, really important. So thank you. F oh, one more question. I think, to yeah, quick one. To that. Um, are you finding any early evidence that these platforms are interested in uh, partnering with outside researchers because they've built these teams in-house and they've absorbed a lot of our students and faculty along the way here from Stanford at least? Uh, and I'm just curious if there's, uh, would they do it for the PR value or are you finding that they really care? Yeah, just Do you have a sense? Yeah, so we, um, Andy Jabolski, who I shared his work, we wrote an open letter to Meta and said basically open up your data. They did not, <laughs> right? Um, so we have called open, open letters to tech companies to collaborate and come into the public square and assume responsibility. That's kind of one example. Um, I think increasingly we are being contacted by companies who either want to do in-house research, who want to know more about what the scientific field at large is, um, is finding. I, you know, whether that's driven by the fact that they're about to be regulated or sued, or whether they have a genuine interest in you know, promoting mental health, uh, I don't know the answer to that, but there's, there's certainly more conversation that's happening. I think the trick will be finding honest brokers that can bring everybody to the table without having to either like work for the tech company to get access to the data or um, you know, create huge conflicts of interest in the scientific community. Great, thank you, Candice, for uh, helping us close off this series. Everybody, w uh, join me in thanking Candice for a great talk and discussion. <laughs> All right, uh, in the fall, we will return. We'll have the summer, uh, the fall seminar series will kick off in October, and we'll announce the uh, speakers soon. Thanks again for coming. Oh, uh, always. But like, look at like. <laughs>